You're listening to Trek FM. Welcome to From There to Here, Trek FM's 50th anniversary Star Trek rewatch. We're going through all 729 adventures in the Star Trek universe from Enterprise to Star Trek Beyond and everything in between. I'm Zach Moore, and today I'm joined by, from Women at Warp, Sue. What's up, Sue? Not much. How are you doing? I'm doing great. You know, we have a lot to talk about. We do. In today's episode. We have Deep Space Nine's The Collaborator, and and we have The Next Generation's All Good Things. Ugh, my heart. I know, right? So, so no time for chit-chat. Let's just get into it. All uh, right. <laughs> Deep Space Nine's The Collaborator. In this episode, Kira's lover is accused of collaborating with the Cardassians during the occupation. Her lover being Vedic Burial. Uh, so, Sue, what did you think of The Collaborator? It's not one of my favorite DS9 episodes, but I actually find it kind of interesting. Uh, I think that is due to mostly my own background. I'm a PK, or pastor's kid, so whenever DS9 gets into the politics of the Bajoran religion, I'm actually really interested in it because I've lived through a lot of politics in religion. And rewatching it this time, it's the first time I've rewatched this episode since everyone was obsessed with the selection of our new pope. And they're essentially ex- uh, electing the space pope, even though I thought the space pope was reptilian. So... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's interesting. I, I like the the story and the the politics surrounding it. Um, I love Win in the way that you love a really horrific villain. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You love to hate her, absolutely. Yes, but yeah, it's it's one I enjoy. Louise Fletcher, you know, an Academy Award winning actress, such a huge get for Deep Space Nine, right? Because Vedic Win and then you know eventually Kai Win at the end of this episode one of the Star Trek's best villains because you know, villains are not always ha ha I'm going to take over the world I'm going to kill you all that kind of stuff like, not, not the Star Trek movie villains now we're talking <laughs> there's there's a lot more shades of villainy than that and she represents a, like the establishment right the legalism and people twisting a religion and, and using it for their own purposes and, and just the over the top niceness and just calling people child and having such a happy expression all the time but, but having such saying such things with a smile on her face nice things but with such hate behind her you know uh just you love to hate you love to hate win and you know vedic burial right this guy i gotta say he's a pretty boring character i was never really big fan of him but episodes like this at least made him interesting i felt Mm -hmm. uh because he just i don't know he was kira's love interest for a long time and that was that was his sole purpose but uh this episode you know as it's revealed he he's running for kai with kai win right or running for kai with vedic win and uh, he's the front runner but he has to drop out because, you know, a lot of things uh, revealed from behind the scenes that he might have been responsible for a terrible massacre in Bajor's past. But it turns out he was covering it up for Kai Opaka. Uh, so taking the fall so so her image would not be tarnished because it's been said many times in Space Nine. She was like, you know, the one figure that, that gave people hope and inspiration through the Bajoran occupation. You know, it's all like the Dark Knight, right, where Harvey Dent does these terrible things, but Batman takes the fall for it so people don't lose their hope in their hero, and that's what's going on here. And I thought that was a great, just a, a great storytelling uh, here to, to use these characters in this way because, you know, Kyle Paca, she'd been killed off, you know, over a season and a half ago, but her presence is still felt, and we see her in these orb visions and all that. And what what did you think of these orb visions, Sue? Because they didn't really, they don't really, uh, they don't really fit into the other kind of orb visions we see, like talking to the prophets and stuff, do they? Yeah, I thought they were a little weird. They felt a little bit out of place. And to be honest, sort of by the end of the episode, I forgot they even happened. <laughs> they they weren't the important part to me. <laughs> right. I mean, it was cool to see Kyle Paca in them and stuff. But other than that, you didn't really need him. It's like, did this episode run short? And they're like, okay, uh, here's what we do. He can look in the orb. Okay, well. Rocket right. ball. <laughs> Rocket ball, right? That's, uh, that's what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Want to play? Uh, but then they're like, <laughs> oh, gosh, we're still. I know we added those two scenes, but we're still five minutes short. Can we add a couple more orb scenes? <laughs> <laughs> but I do really like that they, they talk in this episode about that sort of, you know, Needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one or the few, essentially. Uh, Because Boreal is talking about 
that Opaka made this decision to to give up the location of this space because if she hadn't, that the Cardassians would have destroyed every village until they found it. So even though she even lost her own son in this attack, you know, the it was it was like she decided to to sacrifice this resistance cell in order to save the lives of so many innocent people you know and it's it's a narrative that we hear in war stories a lot yeah i mean that's a tough call obviously she knew where it was because her son was in it which makes it even more tragic uh and you know i think it was like 70 odd people or so in the in the resistance cell and there were you know thousand plus people in this in this valley uh, that the Cardassians would have massacred. So, you know, when you look at the hard numbers like that, looking at it dispassionately, you know, it's, it's a very Vulcan move, I guess, on the on the part of Kai Opaka. Um, so that was that's some dark stuff, you know, that really it's a character who, who, who becomes more interesting, you know, after her departure from the show, really. I love it when they explore aspects of Bajor, and I, I really don't think they did it enough on Deep Space Nine, actually being down on the planet and seeing the internal workings, just because so much else was going on. But being so close to Bajor all the time, I just wish we'd gotten more of of the culture and the government and that sort of thing. Right. You know, I find all, I find all these political things very fascinating. You know, I mean, I mean, people people say, oh yeah, D Space Nine didn't get good until they got the Defiant or until Worf showed up, right? No, no, no. There's a lot of greatness in these first couple seasons, and a lot of it has to do with you know uh, the whole Bajoran situation because it's basically you know, you're going to like a post World War II Europe, right? Yeah, they're <laughs> rebuilding their is. entire planet. Mm-hmm. Mm. So lots, lots of rich story materials to be mined there, and they and they do it to, to great effect. You know, and I love all these all these Bajoran political religious intrigue. It's good stuff. That's what yeah. Dan Brown writes about all the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the collaborator, solid episode. But let's get to what we're really here to talk about, Sue. All good things. Let me get my tissues. I know, right? This episode really needs no summary, right? But it's. The final episode, Star Trek The Next Generation, the series finale. In this episode, Picard finds himself traveling back and forth through time to prevent an anomaly that could lead to the destruction of the human race. So, so, so what did you think of this? This is an okay episode, right? It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> I truly believe, and people can argue with me, that's fine, that this is the best series finale for any TV show ever. And maybe not in a vacuum if you lined them all up, but it is, you, you, I don't think you can argue with me that it is definitely the most fitting for any show ever. You've, you're bookending it with Q. You've got this crew that we know the actors love each other. And this crew loves each other so much. And they're coming together as a family and they're solving things. And my favorite part, the thing that I just love more than anything, is that even though the show is ending, you know that the crew is not ending, that this mission is not ending because at the end of this episode, they're going off on another mission. And I just, it, it, it makes my heart full. It makes me cry every time. However many years later, I can't, it's, it's perfection. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. This is, uh, you know, you're right. Objectively, is it the best ever? I mean, that's so hard to say, but it's the most appropriate, right? The, 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 the most, just the best way to, to tie, to tie the bow on the series, right? Cause everything comes full circle. We go back to you know uh, the Q's trial of humanity, and and this episode really has uh, like if you had to sum up Star Trek in you know one phrase, right? This episode has that. It's when Q's talking to Picard at the end, and he Absolutely. says, "Absolutely, that's the exploration that awaits you. Not mapping stars and studying nebula, but exploring the unknown possibilities of existence." And like, oh man, that is Star Trek. That that's it right there. Uh, I mean, yeah, boldly going and exploring strange worlds. That's all great, but it's really about the human condition, like like. Uh, and that that sums it up so perfectly. In this episode, you, you know, it's 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 a Picard story first and foremost. But everybody gets their moment to shine, right? The past, present, and the future. Uh, and it, it's fun to go back and see, you know, the season one. And they did a pretty good job recreating season one. I think we see we see you know a little before Far Point. We see when when Tashiar, of course, Tashi Tashiar, who always pops up on the next generation, <laughs> can't get away from her. I think we talked about that last time on our vlog, but uh, of course Tasha Yar is here, takes Picard to uh, to the Enterprise for the first time. We see that that stuff, and and uh, you know, interesting bit of stock footage here they used uh, because you know we're not gonna have Jonathan Frake shave his beard to be season one Riker, right? That would be that would be a tra- travesty. 
Um, no, I was paying close attention to that this time and seeing mm-hmm. where they use the video and where they use the voiceover. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's stock footage from the Arsenal of Freedom. And uh, an interesting, in, even another interesting note is in the original broadcast of All Good Things, you could you could see Riker kind of in the jungle, and you could see the the captain, Captain Rice, behind him from that episode. And they actually uh, they actually edited him out. They like painted him out <laughs> on the remastered. So now you just see Riker in the jungle. So so even, you know it didn't it didn't really it wasn't a deal breaker or anything. I just appreciated the extra effort to be like, oh no, this isn't from that episode. He's he's on Farpoint Station right now, just talking <laughs> to Captain Picard. <laughs> I just, I, ugh, I can't. <laughs> words, words do not do it justice, right? It, it, it doesn't. I love how, you know, we've been talking a little bit about, you know, legacy and, and whatever with the last few episodes of TNG. And we see in this future, this future that never comes to pass, of course, how this crew has grown apart. And, you know, two Worf and uh, Riker aren't even speaking to each other, apparently because of Deanna, which, fine. Um, <laughs> but all it takes is Jean-Luc Picard to say, look, I think something is going on and I need your help. And they all come back together and they all help one another again. And they, they heal old wounds and they bury the hatchet and they work together to solve something. And... For me, that's a lot of what this crew, what the Enterprise D crew is about. And it, I, I love it so much. And I love the Pastor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Captain Beverly Crusher, right? Beverly Picard. Be- oh, Be- oh, I stand corrected. Don't Beverly get Picard. it twisted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was a cool spaceship design. I loved all the future spaceship designs, you know, the... the uh, the the Pasteur, obviously, and then and then the, the Klingon cruisers, and then of course the third the in- nacelle. Yeah, the <laughs> Enterprise D two point oh, amazing, right? Such a fanboy design, but so awesome. The huge phaser cannon, they have the extra antennas. What do they do? I don't care. It looks awesome. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and I, you know, there's a lot of obviously there's a lot of tragedy in this future, right? Picard has. Uh, Eremotic syndrome. I can never pronounce that. Right. Eremotic. Eremotic syndrome. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I've Troy. read it in a lot of fanfics. <laughs> there you go. But uh, Picard and Crusher have gotten divorced. Troy is dead. Worf and Riker aren't talking, you know. Uh, but there are a couple things that turned out better in this future. Data is still alive, which is a positive, mm-hmm. you know. And the Enterprise D is still around, which is another positive. The two things I dislike most about the Next Generation movies, the destroying destruction of the Enterprise D, killing off of Data, don't happen in this episode. They are still around 25 years later. Yeah, like you said, it's 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 a perfect way to end this show. Of course, it wasn't planned out this way, right? But but to 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 make the framework like the whole trial of humanity that started in a pilot was such a genius idea. Uh, and and then as Q says at the end, the trial never ends, right? <laughs> We're always out there trying to prove ourselves and and explore those possibilities of existence. Which I which uh, that that's one of the key phrases of Star Trek I cling on to is one of what Q said here. So and then they reset really, after Q leaves to to before any of the time jumping started. Basically, nothing that we saw in the episode actually happened, and the only one who remembers any of it is Picard. And I think what's really lovely about that is that he takes from it... He, he tells his crew what happens in the future, and what all of those characters are taking from it is the fact that they grew apart, and they don't want to let that happen. And the very last thing we see is Picard joining his senior staff for that poker game. And I seriously, I have never had dry eyes at this scene in in all of these years. Picard is such a different man here at the end of the next generation. But when he when he you know, in encounter far point, he was very distant, very, you know, against children and families and. Uh, just a very professional man, you know, but over the course of the series and all their experiences, you know, they've really grown together as a true family because you look around at these guys, no, none of these guys have a real family, you know, despite the, despite the family reunion <laughs> that has been season seven, they're all pretty much on their own doing their own thing. They're career officers, right? And, and who they, who do they have? They have each other. And, and, and that's what this episode really celebrates because when, when, you know, they need to count on each other, they'll do it. When Crazy Picard says we need to go to the neutral zone, everybody says, all right, if Captain John Luke Picard wants to go on one last mission, that's what we're going to do. Uh, you know, if, if uh, Picard and uh, President Picard tells them that he's jumping back and forth through time, they're going to go with it, you know? So it's, uh, 
and even even the past crew after he gives his rousing speech. So it just shows him, uh, as 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 Picard says to Data, Mister Data, you're a clever man in any time period. So just nice little moments like that throughout the entire episode. They're just like, oh, they're just such great fanboy in the fields, right? And it's only made better for me that that we know that these actors also think of themselves as a family, right? So it's not just this crew. It's not just pretend, you know, because we see them at conventions now. And and they act the same way and they and they say the same thing. And it's it's just lovely. I love how much TNG became a family and I feel like they welcomed us as fans into that family. And I understand that I'm being super cheesy right now, <laughs> but I don't care. <laughs> no, there are, t- there are times for that. Now is an appropriate time, Sue. It's okay. But, uh, man, you know, I feel, gosh, you know, I, uh, w- what can we say to do this episode justice, right? I feel like <laughs> I feel like we have this great responsibility here because this is one of the greatest the greatest hours, the greatest moments in Star Trek history. So uh, we all we can say, really, is that we love it. We think it's a perfect finale to a, you know, a great television series. It's not perfect television series, right, but a great television series. Uh, and it really it was a fulfilling way to cap off this seven-year journey you've been on with these characters and, and leaves you wanting more. So, uh, and, and right, as the Enterprise sails off in the sunset, you know in your heart that, you know what, even though the show's over, these guys are going to be out there exploring strange new worlds, you know, new civilizations, all that stuff. And they're going to be doing it together. Yes, and they're, and they're going to be doing it together with this new sense of family. Not not that not that, that family, the family sense had always been there, but now, like, it's, it's solidified. They're all sitting at the poker table now. They're one unified front. Oh, I love them so much. Until six months later, when they crash the Enterprise on a planet, but that's that's besides the point. We're not we're not going to talk about that right now. <laughs> I don't want to ruin your moment, Sue. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, Sue, is there anything else to say about this episode? I think we've pretty much said all we can. All we can in in the framework of from there to here. Yes, of course, <laughs> of course. But all good things must come to an end. So that's oh. going to do it for our discussion today. Sue, if people want to find you on the internet, where can they find you? You can find me on Women at Warp or on Twitter at Spaltor. That's S-P-A-L-T-O-R. All right. And as for me personally, I'm on Twitter at MoronZach. That's M-O-O-R-E-O-N-Z-A-C-H. Now, Sue and I uh, are going to be leaving you. We have a new set of hosts for our next block. But if you're good, we might drop in from time to time. We'll see you out there.